our ag portfolio through technical assistance, supply chain development, policy, and financing. Um, I'm Lydia Pitkin, and I work as program coordinator at the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. Um, I know many of you. <laughs> um, so I'd like to introduce your facilitator, Ellen Kaler, who is the executive director of the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. And thank you all so much for coming. Um, before we get started, I just want to quickly run through some expectations of the session. Um, so be sure your Zoom name reflects your first and last name and your place of work, if applicable. Um, please remain muted unless called upon or engaging in a, you know, an obvious conversation. <laughs> um, you can use the raise hand feature to let the host know that you'd like to speak. Um, and you can also feel free to use the chat function. Um, please do not interrupt others. Please come to the conversation from a place of respect and kindness. Um, and do note that these sessions are all being recorded and will be shared on the website following the gathering. Um, I'm gonna put a link in the chat to the gathering website for your reference. Um, that'll be made public online um, probably this afternoon. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn things right over to Ellen. Great, great. Good morning, welcome everybody. I wanted to uh, welcome you. This is going to be a, a very interesting session. I hope you all had the chance to review the three briefs that we'll be discussing this morning. I want to introduce Janice St. Osh from the Flexible Capital Fund, who will be talking about access to capital. Ella Chapin from the Farm and Forest Viability Program at VHCB, who will be talking about the business and technical assistance brief. And Kyle Harris, who's at the agency uh, and has been part of our, our uh, our uh, Farm to Plate Plan 2.0 leadership team from day one. Um, he's going to be talking about the Ag and Food Policy Brief. So I'm going to um, kick off here by uh, first, whoops, sharing my screen so that you can see. And there we go. So we'll be starting off today for our session this morning. Uh, we will, I'm gonna do a little bit of framing up of our session and then each of the panelists will have about 10 minutes to give a, a review of their brief that they were the lead authors on. And then we'll open it up for clarifying questions, um, but then, but not get into a lot of details because then what we're gonna do is break, we'll have a, the discussion, we'll be able to get into more like truly discussing what was in the briefs um, and focusing in on what is most urgent and most important for us to be uh, working on over the next one to, th one to three years say, uh, as we move forward uh, with Farm to Plate 2.0. Then there'll be a 15 minute break and then we'll come back uh, for a second discussion to look at the role that the network might play in advancing the recommendations, what kind of resources might be needed and get your ideas for additional organizations or people that we wanna make sure are at the table before wrapping up with key takeaways. The, the uh, discussion part two will be in, in Zoom rooms and you'll be able to decide whether you wanna focus on the access to capital, the business and TA brief or the ag and policy brief with Kyle or you could talk about any of them with me. So we'll have four different breakout rooms um, after the break. So um, I just wanted to review for those who maybe were not present yesterday, uh, the timeline of this whole process that Jake reviewed yesterday morning in his opening remarks. Um, these briefs, which you read, uh, if you read them, you noticed there was a lead author and there was somewhere between five and eight contributors to each one of those uh, briefs. And we did that because we really wanted to have the briefs coming from subject matter experts and folks in the field who really are closest on the ground to what's happening in any given topic area. And uh, there were 54 briefs. We've got 53 of them done and in process. We're waiting on the final racial equity brief, as Jake mentioned yesterday. And um, all of those are either have been posted or very soon will be posted on the, on the Farm to Plate website. Um, and these topic areas cover products, markets, and various issues. Um, and as we mentioned yesterday, between May and October, we've been in the process of doing stakeholder engagement conversations with various producer associations and issue groups like Farm to School. Uh, and we have also, we also did a survey uh, that uh, almost 1200 Vermonters filled out. So today's uh, at the gathering, it's really about 
the network diving into the recommendations, which we think of as strategies for the work ahead. And we want to really get your good ideas about what we should be prioritizing for that action going forward. Uh, and then um, just to let you know also that uh, the uh, Farm to Plate leadership team, which is comprised of all of the chairs of all of the various working groups, task forces, and cross-cutting teams, as well as a group of executive directors of food system organizations, all uh, also reviewed both the vision statement and the goals and the, and the objectives that are going to be in the Farm to Plate plan. And um, I let Representative Carolyn Partridge know that we, we would like to have uh, be in, on her calendar uh, on February 10th for the release of the Farm to Plate uh, Strategic Plan 2021 to, 2020 to 2030. So that is the game plan. And then as Jake mentioned, we will be uh, re revamping the network, uh, re redistributing new, new, the recommendations to various new groups and getting underway. So um, I'm going to click off of this um, because uh, I want to just provide a little framing for this conversation. We selected these three briefs because they there is a lot of intersection between the need to help uh, farms and food producers in Vermont both access the right kind of capital, the right type of capital, and Janice will be speaking to some of those ideas. And then marrying that, we're, we're firm believers in marrying the right kind of capital with high quality business and technical assistance. And we are so fortunate in the state to have had the last 15, 17 years of, of building up a network of business service providers. And there's a, a, a wide range of folks who are actually technical service providers as well uh, that uh, are available to Vermont farm and food businesses. And without that, I think we would be so much farther behind in terms of our development uh, in this space as a state. And Ella is gonna be speaking to some of the challenges and opportunities uh, in that regard. And then obviously uh, everything that, there's a whole regulatory and policy environment that so either supports or gets in the way of food system development. And um, the legislature has a big role, at, at, but so does the administration, the Agency of Agriculture, Agency of Natural Resources, and other agencies that are all intersect with the food system. And so a lot of work has been done over the years to really ask the question, what is the right type of regulation? What is the right type of policy for where we are? And it's an evolving uh, aspect of what we do uh, as we as we continue to develop and strengthen our food system. So we'll be diving into those three topics and we'll be looking for places of intersection as well as uh, where we really want to focus. And um, I want you, as you're hearing the presentations, I want I'd ask that you just keep in the back of your mind and listen for how do we think that access to capital, business and technical assistance and, and policy should show up in the structure of the Farm to Plate network for the next 10 years. Uh, and I'll just mention that, for instance, we've not, we've intentionally not had a policy, say policy task force, and the network itself has not, has intentionally not signed on to policy initiatives um, because we're a broad network, we're a big tent with lots and lots of different uh, diversity of, of opinions of organizations. And so, but the, but the question arises is, is this the right time for the Farm to Plate Network to maybe have a policy task force and figure out what would their charge be? So I just wanted to just plant that seed as you're listening to these presentations and especially as we get into the recommendations conversations, think about how do we want uh, this work to show up in the Farm to Plate Network 2.0 uh, in terms of different groups of folks that are working on, on different pieces. So with that, I'm gonna uh, hand it off to Ella and what I'm gonna do is she'll speak and when she gets to the point of the recommendations, I'll pull up a, the slide of the recommendations just so that we all have them in front of us as she continues to address the recommendations. So Ella, it's so all you. Great. Hi everyone. Nice to see you today. Happy Friday. Um, Ellen and Jake and Lydia, thanks for pulling us all together this year in this new and different way. Um, I want to just share really briefly who I am. For those of you who aren't familiar with the viability program, I'm the program director for the 
Vermont Farm and Forest Viability Program, which is in its 18th year. And we are at, based at the Housing and Conservation Board. The program is actually set up in statute by the legislature and it's intended to provide funding for business service providers. So we essentially sort of manage a network of organizations and consultants around the state that do business services for the agricultural and now also the forestry sector. Um, and a lot of our partners are on the, uh, are on the session today and um, may chime in later. So in terms of the current conditions for, um, uh, for the business and technical assistance brief, you know, I guess the way I like to really describe it is that we're sitting at an interesting confluence of rapidly changing markets, as well as a generational transition in assets and land. And because some of the market changes have been really challenging uh, and made business viability more challenging over the last three to five years than they were over the previous decade, um, that means those generational transfers in assets are harder to execute. Um, so we, a lot of us are really concerned about sort of the future of the land use in Vermont, in addition to sort of the business viability and the production of food in, uh, in Vermont. At the same time, we see entrepreneurs as usual being risk takers, innovative, coming up with new solutions in times of crisis like we've seen this past year um, and in times of you know market shifts and new consumer trends so um, you know there's always a real mix of um, positive and negative influences from 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 those larger uh, factors including climate change I guess I would throw in there also as a major driver of um, business model shift um, and then also I would throw in the other context of changing regulations the water quality uh, the wraps have been a really have had a really big impact on businesses and their ability to figure out new plans going forward so that's just another context and among other kinds of regulatory um, challenges and changes uh, I wanted to mention that um, that one of the challenges we always find is that um, entrepreneurs that come into farm and food business often don't have a business in background. They don't have necessarily all the skills of, of managing and running an op a business. And those skills have become more and more critical over time related to those market challenges and finding markets and selling your products. But, um, but in terms of uh, other kinds of um, business management skills as well. So um, in addition, you know, I think Vermont has invested in a really strong network of business and technical assistance provision, as well as really great capital provision and other sort of foundational aspects that support our agricultural sector. Um, that's an important context to keep in mind. We have really great systems in place that we can build upon. Uh, and so I'm just reading through my notes. And then I guess also wanted to just mention another aspect of sort of the business and technical assistance continuum is sort of the mental health, wellness, um, and mediation resources that some of our um, sort of close partners also provide. We often think of a sort of three-legged stool with business and technical assistance, sort of mediation and mental health resources and capital and access to capital. Um, in terms of bottlenecks and, and gaps, the just sheer demand for business and technical assistance providers, I think is um, both outstripping the supply, but also we need to shift and, and adapt. The business assistance and, and technical assistance network needs to shift and adapt in terms of skill set and knowledge, just as the, the whole industry shifts and, and changes. Um, entrepreneurs often don't take advantage of the assistance that's out there. So there's sort of a whole group of folks that we have a harder time reaching. and. You know, maybe they just choose not to engage with folks off the farm or they just don't have time or aren't in the know. So how do we do our best, you know, best at really reaching everyone? Um, and then there's this whole piece around markets. So, you know, while it's not necessarily the job of this brief or this that sector that's providing the assistance to develop the markets, we're seeing more and more interest in the organizations that play roles around business assistance and technical assistance and also helping to develop markets and address emerging markets, uh, needing more market research, best practices, budgets, benchmarks for these new uh, opportunities that folks are, are diving into. Um, and then 
the other piece that I would add that's very, you know, sort of more related to here and now is assistance navigating federal and state relief and recovery programs has been a huge need and sort of relates to generally an interest in trying to figure out how to provide better navigation of the resources that are at hand overall through the business and technical assistance and capital assistance continuums. Um, in terms of opportunities, I think the key opportunities are include um, increased funding to support that really solid foundation of, um, of assistance that's out there. Uh, there's something called the Our Cultural Viability Alliance, until recently called the Blueprint, which some of you might be familiar with. And that's an effort across outside of Vermont um, that can benefit Vermont. That's a, it's, a, it's an association of business assistance providers across New England and Hudson Valley of New York. And that addresses some of the professional development and workforce development needs to have more business and technical assistance providers in the sector that are up to speed on current issues, have the right skills for the businesses that, that we wanna support. Um, uh, we're seeing more connections between lenders capital, or, or we could use more connections between lenders, capital providers, business and technical assistance, like Janice and I really sort of got to know each other a decade ago and worked really closely then. And there's been sort of a, a gap. We all sort of got comfortable sort of knowing we're all out there. I think there's maybe a time for some more um, interaction between those sectors that are somewhat on the call today. Um, and then that navigation piece that I was alluding to under bottlenecks and gaps, there's a lot of room for improved helping people navigate all the different resources that are out there. And in fact, I just wanted to sort of highlight that the um, Vermont Young Farmer Coalition just hired a TA navigator position that I think we'll all be getting to know and hear from them at some point. So those are those. Ellen, you wanna hop over to the recommendations? Um, so hopefully you all have seen these. Uh, one of the key ones is, um, I'm gonna actually go to the next slide for a second, Ellen, just to start at the long list of, you know, we could use so many more people in this uh, business and technical assistance. And, uh, you know, as the, as Farm to Plate finishes, wraps up the 2.0, there's 32 FTEs that have been identified just in sort of business and technical assistance. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there to advance uh, the, the resources that are available. Um, you want to go back a slide, Ellen? Um, you know, while we do the viability program in particular has really heavily invested in one-on-one -on -one business and technical assistance, um, but we're starting to see opportunities and folks focusing on some more peer group opportunities for learning and learning from one another. We also see the need to um, provide more professional development on particularly on succession planning as well as climate change. investigating and creation of searchable database to connect folks with particularly the more professional folks that are around the state that have experience with our culture. Um, and then looking at uh, that outreach piece that I mentioned earlier. Um, I think that's, is that it, Ellen? Yeah, I think, I think that's. So yeah, yeah I'll pause there. I think I hit 10 minutes on the, on the head. Oh my gosh, so excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Ella. So we're gonna hold questions until uh, we get through all three briefs, um, but feel free to add stuff to the chat box um, as we go along. So Janice, you wanna talk about money? Sure, thanks, Ellen. Um, so my name is Janice St. Ange. I'm the president of the Flexible Capital Fund, which provides um, revenue-based financing to companies in Vermont's food system, forestry, and clean energy sectors. I'm also the Deputy Director of the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund in my spare time and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, let's start with what's at stake and what we know. Well, we know that food businesses need different kinds of capital depending on their stage of growth, the scale of operation and the markets they sell into, whether it's direct to consumer or wholesale distribution. We also know that we have an aging population and we're experiencing an unprecedented generational transfer of farmland and food businesses as Ella has talked about. We're seeing some new business models, some flexible and patient capital coming in and business advisors all coming together to support new farmers access to affordable farmland and help farmers transition to the next generation. New food and beverage businesses with higher growth potential products like beer, kombucha, CBD, 
uh, much needed products in these difficult times are seeing an influx of capital during their early stages. But as they grow and need larger and more risk fo focused capital, they're having a hard time raising it from in-state sources. And we all know Vermont is not a Mecca for equity and equity like capital and it never has been. We've historically underinvested in our supply chain infrastructure like processing and distribution that support food products actually getting to market. But impact investing, which is defined as investments across all asset classes that take into account environmental, social and governance factors is experiencing phenomenal growth driven largely by millennials and Gen Zers who want their investments to do more than just make money. There's a growing interest in local food investment opportunities and investments that support diversity, equity, and inclusion in society. So Joel Solomon, author of The Clean Money Revolution said that $50 trillion will change hands from boomers to millennials in North America alone by 2050. It will remake the world. So the opportunity is now to help connect impact investors to food system investments along the entire supply chain. Over the last decade, we've seen funders, investors, and investment structures come into play, like funds focused on providing low cost debt, specifically to food businesses, crowdfunding platforms that support debt and equity offerings for small farms and food producers, grant programs like the Working Lands Enterprise Fund that help strengthen the value chain, intermediaries that are dedicated to providing capital that facilitates farmland acquisition, transfer and succession, and funds like the one that I manage, the Flexible Capital Fund that provide alternative investment structures like revenue-based financing to working lands businesses as an option beyond debt and traditional equity financing. So let's take a look at opportunities and bottlenecks for farmland and farms first. Affordable land access, we know this is one of the biggest costs in starting and growing a farm business. The fact is that Vermont new farmers often don't have the equity and down payment needed to purchase land. And when farmers uh, do purchase land early in the life of their business, they often struggle to have sufficient capital for operating expenses. We've seen new and expanding programs like the Yankee Farm Credit's Young Beginning Small and Minority Farmers Program and VAC and FSA offer low cost real estate and operating loans to beginning farmers. And for land ownership financing, there's DIRT Capital, the Farmlands Futures Fund from the Vermont Land Trust and national programs like Iroquois Valley Farmland Real Estate Investment Trust. Bottlenecks and opportunities for value added food businesses may be a little bit different. I think um, first, we don't have enough educated values aligned in gender or racially diverse equity investors in Vermont that can bring sufficient amounts of risk capital to help businesses grow. Companies benefit from longer payback times to maximize impact, and that kind of capital is not plentiful. Second, there isn't enough attention being paid to succession planning and the requisite capital to facilitate a transition to new ownership. And when it's brought up, it's more often than not too late in the life cycle of the business. And third, very few food businesses have governance boards, let alone advisory boards or mentors to help them navigate the challenges of growing their business. But lest we forget, there was pre-COVID-19 and hopefully soon to be post-COVID-19. And this brief was written prior to the pandemic. So what's changed since COVID broke out? Well, we've seen destabilization of the traditional industrialized food system and more reliance on local and regional food supply chains. There's been a marked increase in local food being sold online, direct to consumer. Food and farm businesses, they've stepped up and pivoted, but the infrastructure isn't always able to support them or keep up with the demand like meat processing facilities and last mile logistics. And there is a disconnect between wanting a resilient system that local and regional food producers offer and the idea that investments in the infrastructure that supports them needs to generate financial returns that can only be achieved by huge scale and hyper-efficiency. Food system funders are offering COVID-19 relief funds to support production through grants and low interest loans that are much needed, but there remains a large gap in risk capital like equity and equity like structures on more patient terms. There's little appetite among traditional equity providers these days to take risk in what are very uncertain and troubling times. 
and with the unprecedented positive COVID cases in this country and the trend of positivity, unfortunately going in the wrong direction, we're not likely to see this change. COVID-19 pandemic has brought the economy to a screeching halt. And while it started its long road to recovery, the economy we know is probably a thing of the past. Now, this was a quote yesterday from the Federal Reserve Chairman, Jerome Powell, which I thought was pretty telling. When COVID hit, our supply chain turned upside down and highlighted the need for strengthening local and regional food supply and resiliency. We're at the nexus of several challenges in 2020 that's amplified the need for values aligned capital to affect systems change. This nexus includes the growing awareness of racial injustice that's existed for centuries in this country, a global pandemic that has had devastating effects on our food system and the economy and is showing no signs of slowing down, heightened awareness of income and gender inequality, deep political division in our democracy and climate change, which is already having significant and costly effects on our communities, our health, our environment and our economy. And all of these things disproportionately impact low income and black indigenous and people of color populations. So as we look at priorities to access to capital for farmers and food system businesses, we really need to ask how can capital providers help entrepreneurs go further faster to build healthy local food systems while ensuring we have a just, equitable and sustainable economy in Vermont and the region. So Ellen, you have the full list of recommendations and feel free to put them up. I'm just gonna highlight some of them, what I think might be the highest priorities in the short and medium term. I may not be going in order um, and it's not to discount what's uh, the full list of recommendations, but I just wanna highlight some of the, the, the ones that I think we can tackle. So number one, keep the Working Lands Enterprise Fund capitalized at a million and a half. Number two, foster and strengthen regional relationships across New England states to bring capital into Vermont, building a wider access to the full spectrum of capital needed. In particular, convening philanthropic, public and private organizations to collaborate on solutions for farm transfer financing, facilitate a pipeline of opportunities that makes it easier for philanthropic organizations to use program and mission related investment dollars to invest alongside others with patient equity as the investment structure. So number three, work with public private entities to explore the creation of an agricultural loan loss reserve fund for businesses that need debt financing but lack collateral. Now this can help with access to debt for food entrepreneurs but would not be a solution for access to equity and equity like financing however. I'm suggesting maybe we take it a step further and consider a loss reserve that could also support investors and intermediaries offering alternative financing beyond traditional debt, such as revenue-based financing, convertible debt and equity. Part of the challenge in Vermont is that we have a small population of investors and funders, and that population is often male and white. We can grow investment dollars in Vermont food businesses by increasing the investor base through an engagement of a more diverse group of investors and, democrat and democratizing investing. How can we do this? Provide targeted education and outreach to Main Street investors to build awareness of where they can put their dollars in intermediaries such as community development financial institutions and credit unions who are lending to and investing in food system businesses. We can provide education on how people can participate in crowdfunding opportunities now available to non-accredited investors. Less than 5% of all venture capital and angel funding predominantly in the form of equity goes to uh, women entrepreneurs. And the number is 3% or less for people of color and Latinos. On the supply side, 95% of equity investors are white men. So if we wanna make change in who's getting the investment dollars, we need to change the story of who is investing. So we can target education on investing in food businesses towards women and black indigenous and people of color populations. And I'll leave you with this. In addition to financial capital, farmers and food entrepreneurs need human and social capital. Having the right people and talent, networks and connections is as critical as money to grow a business and consist with the transition 
assist with the transition of that business to new ownership when the time comes. So that's why this nexus of technical assistance and business advisory capacity along with capital and policy is so important to have a conversation about how we can come together to make this happen. Thanks. Thanks so much, Janice. Really appreciate it. Lots of, lots of good stuff there. Kyle, talk about policy, will you please? All right, that's a, <clears throat> that's a black hole, but let's see, let's see how we do. And Ellen, let me know if um, my headphones, <clears throat> excuse me, are, uh, are not coming through clearly and I can try to speak up. Um, so I'm Kyle Harris. I'm with the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. I'm an ag development specialist focusing on economic development and emerging issues. I see a lot of my colleagues at the agency on this call, which is um, exciting. Uh, my background is I'm an attorney by trade. Please don't hold that against me as we talk about policy. Um, I also have a master's in environmental policy and I spent some time <clears throat> working in the DC world, the food and ag world down there for, for four to five years. So a lot of how I think about food and ag policy uh, for better or worse is really shaped by how the federal government looks at food and ag policy. But what I wanted to try and do was um, start this by trying to define what public policy is. And if I ask policy in and of itself is kind of an amorphous term. Um, it's something that everybody thinks about differently. If I ask the other 35 people on this Zoom call their definition of, of public policy or, or just policy, I would maybe get, you know, 35 different answers. And, you know, some of it is so, um, an answer could be so basic as po policy is taking a legislative mandate or statute or in setting a program up based off of that mandate. Um, it's, or, you know, creating um, a, regulations around it or a set of rules, et cetera, et cetera. The other end of the spectrum uh, is public policy making is literally a black box where good ideas go to die or you don't see them for five years. Um, that's kind of cynical, just trying to cut the tension a little bit. Um, but I think it, when you really boil it down, it's it's somewhere in the middle there. Like if you, you look at the first um, sentence and I'm not gonna read my brief verbatim, but if you look at the first sentence, public policy is generally described as a system of laws regulatory measures, courses of action, and funding priorities concerning a given topic promulgated by a government entity or its representatives. That in and of itself is policy, but it's, it's cyclical, it's more than that. It's not just a mandate given by a legislative body, whether it's the state or the federal government and whatever agency is responsible for turning that mandate into something that we feel and is implemented in our day-to-day -day lives, it's not, just that it's it's this cyclical approach where we learn from previous regulations rules programs that inform the next statute or mandate and all of these public and private actors who are really experts in their field no matter what it is informing those decisions as they're made through statute statute and mandate and i think another big caveat to public policy making is humans, it's human nature to think of things um, in categories or categorize or compartmentalize certain things. When we think about healthcare, we think about healthcare policy or environmental policy or international trade and financial regulation. One of the reasons that I've always really enjoyed food and ag policy is that it's all of those together. It's, it's challenging, but it's fun. You've got to think about so many different things as, as it relates to what makes good food and agriculture policy. So at the federal level, you know, obviously we've all heard the term, the farm bill and what the farm bill is. And I think, you know, it'd be no surprise here, um, but in talking with people, some people are surprised that the SNAP program and food stamps are part of the farm bill every five years. Um, forest management has some elements in the farm bill. Um, rural energy projects have uh, a place in the farm bill or, or its own title in the farm bill even. It's, it's crazy how all encompassing public policy is from a food and agriculture perspective. Since like, I think it's 1933 was the first iteration of the farm bill. I know it was during the great depression, but we're 90 years into the farm bill as it is stands right now. And the federal government is supposed to hit um, a new farm bill every five years, whether or not that happens, um, that's another conversation. The farm bill in and of itself has really grown over the last 90 years for better and for worse. As, as we've moved through the 40s, the 50s and 60s, the US industrial complex really started to take hold on not just food and agriculture, but every single industry 
uh, that the U.S. is built around. And within agriculture, there's been a lot of consolidation to where only a couple companies, uh, a couple parent companies, Looks like Kyle may have frozen. Oops, Kyle, you there? So much for being in downtown Montpelier. <laughs> Let's see if we can get him back here. A is back. All uh, right. Sorry, I think That's the right. people, that, people that I talk can. I apologize. Um, no, I think we're good, Lenellen. I appreciate it. Ellen, do you know, would you let me know in my ramblings where, where you last heard me? No, I think you're muted. Okay, I'm just gonna keep, can everybody Ellen, hear me? Ellen, you're muted. <laughs> Oops, Kyle, you're good. Go ahead, yep. Okay. So over the, over the middle of the 20th century, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, as the federal farm bill grew along with the U.S. industrial complex and the consolidating of a lot of food and ag businesses, um, we really start, started to see how food and agriculture was treated uh, within the broader you know, U.S. social, environmental, et cetera, system. And what it was was a... Um, um, quantity over quality, um, shelf life stability, and really um, where did food and ag fit into everybody's monthly budget? It was a race to the bottom. Cheapest was best. That's what, how people thought about their food. And over the last 20 to 30 years, what you've really seen um, in Vermont, you know, was on the forefront of this in, in, the, in the mid 90s was focusing on quality over quantity transparency in food production, wanting to know where those inputs as a product was grown um, or processed, how and why that was happening. And local food production over the, the agribusiness monstrosity um, where we were never really able to pinpoint exactly when and where our food was coming from. And so I think this is very important because Vermont has a lot of opportunity here. Um, from, as I said, in the mid nineties, Vermont really started to be on the forefront of, of understanding healthy soil, thriving communities, clean water, water all helped to make healthy people. We started to see folks wanting to spend more money out of their pocket, um, focusing, focusing on, on food. And that's a, it's a great thing. I think that in and of itself presents some challenges because we all know that you shouldn't be able to afford healthy food. Everybody should be able to access healthy food. But you know, there is some there is some bottlenecks and some gaps that are going to prevent us from getting there. I mean, the, the federal farm bill um, is commodity driven, which can be a challenge. Of the ten biggest commodities, at least mentioned in the farm bill, Vermont can hang its hat on one, which is dairy. And we don't need to get into that conversation right now. There's a whole other panel dedicated to the challenges. Uh, you know, presented to the dairy industry moving forward. But when you're looking at a commodity driven system, that's how uh, checkoff programs are made. That's how research is divvied out. That's how you learn to move certain commodities forward. And in a state like Vermont, where we have a very diversified agricultural portfolio without a lot of these big commodities to hang our hat on like corn and soy and wheat, et cetera, et cetera, we're kind of left to work on the peripherals of the farm bill and figuring out how we can get into each of the 12 different titles and really take hold of some of the federal opportunities that might be there. Another big issue with agriculture, another big, I'll get to the recommendations. One more thing that I wanna mention, Ellen. Um, agriculture is often perceived through its, bad through its bad examples. Agriculture a long time ago, unfortunately lost the court of public opinion. We think about things in agriculture that are done poorly, not those that are being innovative in the integral role that agriculture can play in solving climate change and other environmental issues. So with that, Ellen, let's move to 
um, some other recommendations. So in my opinion, um, I really think that there's a lot that the Farm to Play Network can do to, helps, to help foster and, and stimulate some of the recommendations that we, that we really came up with as a group um, of authors. You know, one, uh, it's important for policymakers and others to prioritize farmers' mental health via programs and educational events, trade wars, climate change, depressed commodity prices, labor issues. None of these are something that we can necessarily have control over but it's something that's really important and it really gets back to that, you know, pub good public policy making is the connective tissue between all these major buckets of policy. Um, provide at least 1.5 million funding annually to working lands. This has been something that's been talked about, super supportive of that. A lot of these recommendations are either, you know, funding that how, where the state legislature can really help us out. Um, you can move to the next page, Ellen. Um, and others are, are, are a sense of um, all the folks that are interested in food and agriculture within the state can really form the backbone of how Vermont can really be a big player moving forward. That's one of the greatest things about this state. I mean, in, in DC, I wasn't able to see kind of this, this kind of landscape at the state level, but there's so many folks that are interested in being a part of the conversation that we should um, develop or, or excuse me, we should have a partnership with ag and food stakeholders and build a comprehensive and fully aligned state agricultural policy roadmap. It's super important that we do that because if we're gonna compete with these other states to get a lot more federal help from a commodity perspective, we need to have a plan in place that can really help show how Vermont can move forward with a diversified ag portfolio. And it's even, you know, as far as COVID goes, that's even more important right now, as Janice mentioned earlier and Ella mentioned earlier, you know, the local food movement is, has taken off through COVID. If there's a silver lining to some of the stuff that is coming out of 2020, it's that we cannot continuously rely on the commodity driven system as it's been, um, you know, stood up over the last 90 years. There's an inflection point where we need to start moving forward and thinking about how diversified ag portfolios can really um, lend itself to the future. So in case, we have another pandemic like this where slaughterhouses are, are hitting critical mass and you can't book um, the case for slaughtering for over a year out. We need to figure out how we can move forward here. I will, just men I will just mention one more thing, Ellen, um, and it's, you know, COVID is, is a huge issue right now, but we also did just have an election, which means that policy objectives are going to be changing. And as I look through some of the stuff that the Biden team has put out, um, it's important for Vermont and it's, an, it's gonna help from a policy perspective drive states like Vermont forward. The Biden the president-elect Biden has said, you know, he's planning on rejoining the Paris Agreement, which is gonna help us on climate action. And for those that are not aware, that's keeping global temperatures um, below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Revitalizing rural communities is a focus for, the, for his administration. Addressing racism in agriculture is also important. Rural broadband, antitrust enforcement, and antitrust enforcement is important for to keeping those big agri agribusiness giants from over dominating a lot of the public policy sphere that goes on inside the Beltway in DC. And the bioeconomy and bio-based manufacturing. As we look forward and think about new uses for ag products, where can we really look to agriculture to replace some of our reliance on fossil fuels? So, um, there's a lot going on. Um, thank you for, hopefully I didn't go too far over time. Thank you, Ellen. You're good, thanks. You covered a lot of ground in a very short period of time. So thank you so much. Um, so we can take some, um, some clarifying questions and then we've got about 15 minutes before we take a break that we wanna talk about uh, based on the briefs, what stands out as the most urgent to start addressing and, um, and then also what stands out as important to address over the coming decades. Some things are gonna just take, have a longer uh, period of time to, to bring to fruition, but uh, really wanna hone in on those that are really most urgent uh, to start right away with. And um, are there, and for instance, there may be some things that are missing uh, in some of the recommendations that are important to you, especially as Janice talked about sort of in the post COVID world, uh, 
uh, two out of these three briefs were, were written pre-COVID. So there may be some new things that have emerged that we wanna try to capture as well. So uh, I'll open it up um, if folks wanna um, address uh, these questions. I'll stop sharing, hopefully you'll remember those. Um, anybody have a, let's see, do we have something in the chat box here? Um, some information from Eric, any, any questions? Clarifying questions or, or thoughts on what you would think of as sort of most uh, urgent to be focused on over the next one to three years uh, within Farm to Plate, given the, the presentations on the recommendations. Leslie, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Uh, yes, so thank you. Um, as you had mentioned at the beginning, I'm the new Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at UVM and the Interim Director of UVM Extension. And so one question I have been asking repeatedly is how do farmers and stakeholders best get their information? And Anson was, Tebbets was telling me, for example, well, Instagram is, is one mechanism. And I've been asking our extension team, are we using the right communication channels? And I think that's critical to the point earlier of entrepreneurial farmers not reaching out and not getting the capital that they need and not getting um, the, the information that we need. And so I wanna ask how best should we be communicating? And I'd like opinions from people here. Okay. And, and I know that, you know, we've been using Facebook to a certain extent, we've got the TV program across the fence, but I'm, I'm wondering if we should be using other channels. Great, thanks Leslie for your question, really good one. Panelists or anybody else wanna, what's worked, what's, what's been useful? And Twitter, of course. <laughs> I, I can just say from our perspective, so we, we don't work with, uh, necessarily with farmers, but work much uh, far, a little bit farther up the value chain with food manufacturers, producers, logistics, and distribution. And LinkedIn has been a very powerful tool for us um, because uh, most of our businesses are on LinkedIn and use that from a business perspective. Facebook, not so much because it's dwindling. And then especially for the younger generation, they're not even on Facebook anymore. Right. Uh, my kids defriended me and left me. Um, and, and Instagram, I don't tweet, but I'm, I know Twitter is another um, me mechanism. Yeah, I would just add, you know, I think it's a, a deep question that Leslie poses and one that could take, you know, hours to sort of touch on, but I'd just say diversifying our communications channels, I think has been just overall a really important process. And we have entrepreneurs of all ages and, and of all, you know, from various cultural backgrounds. I just, I think that there has to be a diversity and, and a and larger effort. And, and sometimes that means a larger budget, right? P put towards outreach and communications. Something maybe to make sure is highlighted in, in the Farm to Plate 2.0 around communication strategies. Yeah, and I'll just piggyback off of what Ella mentioned. I know at the agency, we're constantly asking ourselves this question, how do we, you know, find the biggest penetration rate for for reaching folks from a lot of different, you know, agriculture corners of the state um, and making sure that we get them the information that we want to get them. And it's, it's a combination of a lot of things. Some folks still watch their favorite farm show in the morning or have their favorite radio station. And, you know, as Secretary Tebbets alluded to, Instagram is, is one of his favorites for sure. And it's becoming quickly, I think, one of the favorites for a lot of others in the, in the community as well. And I think I'll just add one quick point to that. I was on a call the other day talking about new Americans broadly in terms of lending and investing and new American owned businesses. Um, and in those populations where English is not their first language, oftentimes it's someone from a social services agency who's doing one-on-one -on -one conversations and or um, they were talking about doing finance house parties 
for people coming over to this country who don't understand our financial system um, and how effective that's been. So oftentimes it's culturally understanding, you know, what, how much knowledge they have or don't and then how to reach them. And it may very well be, even though in the age of COVID, we can't do this as much, trying to find a way to reach them one-on-one -on -one and or um, personally. Interesting point. Yep. Other well, questions, yeah. thoughts on uh, what we should be focusing on? Definitely communications, hearing that very strongly. Jane? Did you call on me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, something that I'm thinking about because it was um, sort of my favorite pet idea from the marketing world, but I think it resonates here too, is, um, you know, thinking about um, sort of taking on this trend of intersectionality and really looking at how are we stronger when we cross over into other industries. I think that's true both from a policy perspective and also a financing perspective. Um, so ecosystem services being a perfect example of um, an initiative that can cross between food and agriculture and recreation and tourism um, and obviously taking care of the environment. Um, so just looking for those places where we can actually broaden our tent, particularly to connect with industries that may have more um, kind of different like power structures and financing expectations. I think I, um, I remember Gay saying a couple of years ago, like if people aren't gonna pay for food, then let's make farms about recreation um, and other services. Uh, and I think that that feels powerful to me, like rather than trying to keep getting investors to invest in, you know, to change their expectations of their returns on the food industry, can we tap into a different kind of financing structure um, with a different kind of sort of profit, profitability and expectation? So I'll just wrap up, but so thinking about ecosystem services, thinking about outdoor rec and tourism, and then also the energy sector and what's happening with, with green energy. And can we, can we tie ourselves um, from the food and ag world, you know, really make close allies with those other industries that may have more capital and more political sway. Great, thanks, Jean. Hopefully folks are also, um, checking the chat box because various folks are uh, listing things in there that they're that they're focused on. Um, uh, Lawrence, do you want to say your question? Well, it was less of a question and more of an observation just following up on Eric's comment in the post, which is that, you know, he was he was saying, hey, there's scenario planning to be able to navigate uncertainty in a meta level, farm to plate needs to be able to navigate that uncertainty as well. I think the trends in Vermont for COVID this week are clear indication that we're gonna be you know, needing to lock back down um, and all of us are gonna be amending our behaviors again, um, it looks like. And, and you know, it just raises the question of what's the legislature reasonably gonna have the capacity to tackle this year. And as we lay out a policy agenda coming from this, it, it may need to be condition dependent and look for those opportunities that have triggers in the real world to pursue um, rather than saying, okay, we think we'll get to this in July. We, we have no idea what July is gonna look like. Yeah, that's a really, it's a really good point. And uh, I think the, uh, the, the way to think about this coming year is gonna be less is more, having, having less mo like super strategic, what's most critical to be working on this year uh, and just recognize it's gonna be a lot less than we might always, otherwise be able to accomplish in, in, in non-COVID years. So very good point. Um, uh, David Miskel, you had a question about about new models meeting Act 143, which is the uh, the on farm uh, accessory business. Uh, did you want to say more about that? Your question. Um, yes, uh, I was involved in the um, early 80s on trying to look at this issue uh, because I saw that from farms that I had worked on in Europe, 
that the farm stores were really valid and very strong um, aspects of the farms. And there was tremendous communication and marketing between farmers. Um, we've seen with the COVID that um, the Vermont farms have reacted unbelievably well to um, increase their models. And um, I do consulting for farms and developers on, on um, uh, issues related to different policies and, and regulations. And I have three clients right now that are wondering whether their proposed um, um, purchases of farms as well as expansions of farms meet uh, Act 143. Um, I did speak recently with a town planner about Act 143 and this town actually put forth some additional regulations uh, and his, his quote was, go forth and multiply. We will go after you if you go over. Um, as a consultant, it's really hard for me to propose uh, to these clients what to do. Um, and originally Act 143 was looked at to, to not have this confusion within the state. And it seems like it's, it's becoming more confusion at this point or People are neglecting it and, and, and hoping that they won't be uh, regulated by it. Or uh, So the question comes up to me. Yeah. Um, we, we put together in the early 80s a, a plan in Shalott, um, and we did a cooperative farm stand. Um, it never quite happened, but uh, right now the rules would prevent that as far as I could read it. And I think that that might be a model that we really should be looking at. Okay, thanks, David, that's very helpful. Uh, and I would say my takeaway from having worked on Act 143, which again is the on-farm accessory business legislation that passed a few years ago, is that oftentimes we, um, those of us who work on pub, on actually helping to the legislature pass good regulatory, good regulations, is that then we're like, okay, we're, we're kind of done. <laughs> and uh, what we found with Act 143 in particular is there's a lot more work that needs to be done with outreach, education, providing uh, uh, helpful uh, FAQs. The agency's done a great job, but they've, but they've been really uh, low on capacity for staffing to be able to really do the level of outreach and the, and the uh, level of of support to town planners and administrators uh, and the farm community for, for that matter to really help um, it be clear what the intent was with Act 143. So I think your, your point is well taken and there's a lot of additional uh, outreach work that needs to happen to help uh, people like you who are working as a consultant with farms to make good decisions uh, on their property. So um, I'm gonna take one last question before we go to a break. Anybody got a burning question or have some thought about this question of what we should work on the next one to three years from any of the recommendations that were laid out? Yes, please, Janine. Jeannie. Um, thanks. Uh, it seems like uh, supporting um, technical assistance and access to capital for BIPOC farmers and entrepreneurs would not only be a step towards equity, but help flip and move the needle on some of the other issues that we're trying to work on. Um, so I would, I would see that as urgent and helping facilitate some of the other change that we're looking for. Yes, good point. Yeah, very good point. And and a lot of organizations are are in fact pivoting to really figure out how they can uh, best uh, get their programs, their capital, their and their uh, business and technical assistance um, to BIPOC farmers and food entrepreneurs in a in a more robust way that we've really not done well enough on that uh, over the years. So I'm glad that you brought that up because it's a, a really really important point. All right, we're going to go to a 15 minute break. We're going to come back at 11 o'clock. And uh, at that time, you'll be able to select whether you want to spend more time talking about capital with Janice, business and technical assistance with Ella or ag policy with Kyle or whatever you want to with me. And uh, we'll see you back here at 11 o'clock. And uh, yeah, we'll see you at 11.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks to the panelists. Ellen, do we need to leave and then nope. come back? Stay right on. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That's, the, that's the clarification. If you're recording out of breakout rooms, you have to record to your computer. The um, main room will be the only one that can record to the cloud and Zoom. Right. Okay. All right, so I think I think we're back here. I just want to just uh, before we go to the breakout rooms, I just want to um, highlight what it is we're going to be focused on here. So um, this will be an opportunity to dig in a little bit more deeply on the recommendations and the conversations that were launched by our presenters on their topics. So we want to what are what's the most important recommendations. Uh, uh, and what is the role for the network in playing and, and moving those recommendations forward, um, both short and long term? What are some of the opportunities you see uh, for additional resources, support, collaboration um, to these recommendations? And who else do we want to make sure is at the table? So we're going to have um, uh, the next 35 minutes, uh, um, Lydia, we're gonna wanna pull people back at 11.35. So you'll have just shy of 35 minutes to talk in our breakout rooms. And Lydia, why don't you share how we're gonna do the breakout rooms? Sure, so I don't exactly know how we're gonna do the breakout rooms. This will be a fun experiment. Um, this is a new feature in Zoom is that you can self-select your breakout rooms, but I have never used it before. So. Um, I've set up the breakout rooms. There are four, Access to Capital with Janice, Business Assistance with Ella, Ag and Food Policy with Kyle, and everything with Ellen. Um, and Ellen, Kyle, Ella, and Janice, you will be automatically bumped to these rooms when I open the room. Um, for everyone else, I'm hoping that when I click open rooms, you'll have an option to choose which one. Um, if you don't, please just send me a note in the chat. Um, letting me know which one you want and I can assign you and you'll get automatically bumped over. So I'm going to go ahead and hit open rooms and we will see how this goes. We'll see you back here at 1135. Damn. You're on mute. You're on mute. Got to unmute. Might be just you and me, you know? You know, well, nobody... that would be cool. Oh, oh, we nope. got Catherine. Oh, oh we got Travis. Travis. What, what is Travis? Oh, we got Abby. It's like a, it's like a <laughs> Jeopardy thing. I'll take, I'll wow. take everything with Ellen for a thousand. Wow. <laughs> for a million. <laughs> That's yes. hilarious. A rare moment, a rare moment. <laughs> and then I was like, what the hell are we going to do with Ellen? I don't even know. I got to join it and find out. <laughs> David. What's she going to do with us is the question. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is in the uh, business viability one, Sam. I just, you know, he's <laughs> over that. <laughs> yeah. Who needs that it's stuff? Overrated. Viability is overrated. <laughs> I want to talk about fun things. <laughs> Intersectionality. Let's go. Yeah. Well, you know, Janet, I I was uh, I helped with Janice's too, and that topic is like really that's a really fun one, and she did such a great job on that. But yeah. I wanted to be able to. I want. I'm like a big picture guy. <laughs> I want to talk all. Of it. Come on. <laughs> great. All right. Well, looks like, wow, got quite a few people here. And Leslie keeps changing her background. <laughs> exactly. Is Where's that a shot of? Morgan Horse Farm. Way oh, Morgan. nice. Sweet. All right. So it looks like we got a good, good crew here. And uh, I don't know if everybody knows each other. So when you, if you uh, talk, if you speak, uh, please introduce yourself so that, um, uh, those of us who don't know as many of us can can learn who we are. So, um, so the big, I, I guess we can just really just talk about this intersectionality here between the three briefs. And it's really about, you know, given capital needs, given business and technical assistance needs, and given policy needs, 
what do you really think the network should should be focused on over the next say you know three years in particular how to structure it you know like i mentioned in, in my opening remarks like we could have a policy task force we could have um, a task force that was across all three of those issues because of how interconnected they are. Like we're really just wiping the slate clean in terms of the network structure. Um, and we're gonna wanna do additional outreach to bring additional people and organizations into the network in, in ways that um, they haven't before. So we really are looking at how do we reset uh, going forward here? And wh what are these three briefs in particular sort of giving us a sense of, plus your own experiences, giving your, us a sense of, of what we should be prioritizing over this next bit of time. So it's, this is really an open conversation. We've got about 30 minutes and um, we'd just really love to hear your thoughts on that. What's popping for you? I'll start. Oh, oh go for it. Leslie, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, I think I figured out how to raise my hand in Zoom. I'm usually on Teams instead of Zoom, but I was just gonna say, keep in mind also how, uh, oh, I need to introduce myself. So I'm Leslie Parisi. I'm the relatively new Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at UVM. I moved here during the pandemic from North Carolina. I'm also the interim director of UVM Extension and we have a search on for a new director. Uh, but I was going to say, just added to all this, just keep in mind, how can UVM, the College of Agricultural Life Sciences, or CALS, and UVM Extension better help any of the initiatives that you're talking about? Yeah, thanks for that, Leslie. And um, now I'll figure out how to lower my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, uh, you know, one of the interesting things that, um, because not, not all the briefs have been, have been released yet, you all haven't seen the 275 recommendations across the 54 briefs. And um, uh, I've, been, I've been deep in it because we are uh, in the process of trying to prioritize them to go into the strategic plan document. And Abby and Allison Eastman and I spent time yesterday thinking about what is the highest priority for the fiscal 21 legislative session for the agency to put forward. And, um, and uh, Leslie, just so you know, there is an awful lot of the recommendations that say UVM should hire such and such of, of a TA provider. So um, when we get together, there's gonna be a lot for us to talk about in terms of the future of UVM extensions uh, role in, in this next 10 years. And um, we're gonna need to figure out how to help you raise a lot of money. <laughs> right, because UVM also has a hiring freeze on. As do many universities across the country right now, thanks to COVID-related yeah. expense. Yeah. So welcome, Carolyn. Um, so uh, thoughts? Yes, Travis, go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Travis. I'm the director of the Intervale Center for folks that don't know me. One of the themes that this keeps coming up, like yesterday and today, is there's a lot of existing work that we do, and we do it really well in Vermont. And there's some low hanging fruit that needs more resourcing. Um, and I see that sort of across, you know, these areas, you know, where we're saying like invest in WeLab, invest in the farm viability network, um, look at, you know, and, th and then there's sort of the innovation and where do we sort of go additionally. And it feels like having farm to plate working for 10 years, we sort of know what really works pretty well, um, but we're clearly under resourced in those areas. And so how do we think really thoughtfully about putting dollars that are needed into existing known, known elements while also making sure we're innovating um, and strike that balance really well, you know, looking at scarce resources. Yeah, great point. Sam, you were wanting to jump in. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I'll raise my hand. Um, I, would, I would echo what Travis said. I, I think I, have, I am concerned a little bit about um, the existing capacity that we've really built in the network and the desire to see that um, sort of funded and then really thinking about innovation. I do think we have a real opportunity in the next one to three years um, related to the increased uh, sort of the increased market for local goods um, relating to COVID. Like I and I you know, I think that there were farmers that were sort of tapping into that trend already before COVID, but COVID just created this sort of explosion of demand for local products where 
a lot of farmers were completely overwhelmed. Um, but I do, I've worked with a number of businesses over the past two to three years that have really um, decided to shift to a more, um, more robust retail presence and, and then adopting the model that David was actually talking about where they're creating a retail market that provides more of a whole diet experience that's almost like shopping in a food co-op. I, I always point at the Roots Market in Middlesex because I think that John and Karen do a really great job. And they're in a lucky spot there where they don't have to um, worry about the Act 143 regulations, but um, I'm working with at least two other farms right now, three other farms right now that have retail stands that are operating in a real gray area because they are bringing in products that are all from other local farms. The majority of them are from other local farms, but they're sort of towing the line around what constitutes uh, legally an on-farm accessory business. And I think that that retail, the direct retail market is where the margins are the best for our local producers. And I think there's a lot of room for growth. COVID has made that even more, uh, like just more of an opportunity there. But, and those are the, those are the businesses that we actually see uh, viability, you know, and, and the capacity to support other local farms that don't have access to markets in those retail settings. So, and we have some great examples from, you know, farms that have been in business for like 30 years, like Walker Farm and Woods Market Garden, where they've done that on a seasonal model. But I think people, more and more farms are looking at, can we do this year round and, um, staff up year round and produce things year round and purchase in from other local producers yep. year round. So that's, that's a great a real yeah. opportunity. Great point, Sam. And uh, one of the things that I serve on the Working Lands Enterprise Board, and we've been seeing more proposals for standing up farm stands on their property and, and having small structures. Um, but your point is well taken about the Act 143 gray areas. And so, Carolyn, um, that'll be something for us to, to be thinking about in terms of the next session about, you know, do we need to go in and make some, some uh, very targeted uh, razor-like adjustments or not? Yeah, it, that, that's a real tough one. I mean, we tried so hard to thread the needle and get everybody on board with that. And, um, and then there were some, you know, planning folks from various towns, some of whom had weighed in on the bill and some of whom didn't, um, who all of a sudden took that as an opportunity to sort of over what I consider to be overreach, but um, we got to take a look at how that, you know, how we can switch it or how we can change it in such a way that um, it meets our goals. Yeah. Yeah, Abby. Yeah, so excess, I, David, I heard you mention earlier kind of this accessory on farm business, Act 143 piece being confusing or maybe even misrepresentative of its intended purpose. And I think my sense, um, as kind of Carolyn acknowledges, it, we, we threaded the needle as to what the municipal community, the planning community, and the ag community were comfortable with. And I think where we're at right now is in a, a state of a, a dearth of clear information and a, and a lack of clarity and consistency between towns. Um, but I think the regulation can work as it is drafted, but I think there's still a lot of education at the municipal side and at the farm side um, and the value added business side to um, ensure that we're making the best use of that legislation as it exists. Um, and there may be an opportunity to change it. We've been open to kind of proposing a, a, a modification if, if we could identify what it would be. And that's not kind of presented itself. It's really more been towns are interpreting it differently. Some towns have the, the opportunity to do that. And in other cases, it's just not been, they haven't been clear. Um, so. I, I'm happy to talk with you or we're happy to talk more about it. And I do think it's certainly, um, as Ellen mentioned, it's it's in the top 10 kind of priorities of the agency for this next session to really look at this land use, land development opportunities and Act 143 is, is squarely in there. So 
Yeah, and Ellen, I could just bounce off of that. I'm I'm on the 143 team at the agency along with with Abby and and with Ellen to a degree. And and what Abby said is not just anecdotal. We've we've done surveys of a lot of uh, zoning municipal planners, administrators throughout the state, and there's just a lot of um, folks that are trying to to figure out ways to do it uh, within their municipalities. And there isn't a lot of uh, consistency, for lack of a better way to describe it. And and we're we were doing a lot of work on this um, around February, March, other things kind of took priority and it's, it's something that we're trying to re-engage in um, as 2021 looms. Great, thanks. Lawrence, I'm hoping I can call on you here because uh, you, you do a lot of consulting for businesses higher up the value chain uh, and I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts over the next few years, what you're seeing on the horizon for those um, sort of more middle of the value chain infrastructure, heavy on the infrastructure types of businesses and sort of where do they play out at the intersection of capital needs, business assistance needs and policy support um, that because they're off, they're off, they're often they're, they're getting inputs from the farm community. So what are you seeing on the horizon? You know, in a lot of cases, those folks have some, you know, meaningful capital needs that can be satisfied by bank debt um, because they've got collateral, they've got equipment that can be pledged so long as they don't overspend. Um, but, you know, we continue to see uh, construction costs exceeding market value of properties. So there's a need for uh, extra non-debt capital to fit up and, and things that um, really can't be barred against because they, their liquidated value on day one is lower than uh, what it costs to put it in. Um, I think there's some good opportunity for more collaboration between businesses. Um, in, in the brewing world, that looks like alternating premises. Um, but, you know, that, that type of activity where, where a facility might be used or staff might be shared among different product lines um, certainly seems like something that's that's going to come down the pike. I worry a lot of just about total management capacity and and aging and where things are and the need to have support networks for entrepreneurs and value added as well as in um, farm based to you know build up the supports that they need um, to grow quickly. Um, yep, thank you. Other observations, priorities? Catherine, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Catherine Cusack, uh, for those of you who don't know me, from Green Mountain Farm to School up in Newport. Um, I think something that's just standing out for me, Ellen, and others is, you know, the, the basic infrastructure needs. I think we've come a long way. We're not there yet. And now seems like a really crucial time to, to continue to, to pay attention to those needs. I think COVID has highlighted some of those needs. I also think that COVID has opened a lot of opportunity, um, you know, for our grassroots efforts and our uh, nonprofits, government, everything. I feel like the there's a lot of opportunity to be had and yet to be learned um, in the wake of COVID. And, and so I think that's, you know, kind of out there and how do you move forward with Farm to Play 2.0 with, with that still unresolved is a big challenge for you. Um, but something that's really standing out is the, the need for FTEs and what was it, 32 FTEs was one recommendation. There were dollars all down, up and down the recommendations for basic human resources. I think we have a lot of good systems in place, um, you know, to, to piggyback on the need for people, the, the proper training. Um, we're at a, again, a pivotal point and we, we need to, you know, improve our knowledge base, come together more, mentor more. I think Lawrence is hinting on that, um, have those really cohesive cohesive groups um, that can lean on one another in a, in a very strategic way seems to be beneficial and has been beneficial throughout the first 10 years. And so that would be great to, to see that continue. 
um, in some form. Mm -hmm. um, but and even maybe more narrow than the, the working groups that um, currently exist. Sometimes they're they're large, and you know I don't know if it gets down. And I know there's several layers, um, but really that networking, um, human resource capital investment seems really yep. vital. Yep. Travis, you want to jump in? Um, yeah, I was going to say something else, but I'll, I'll just underscore what Catherine has said. And it, and it feels like it's a lot of human resources when you say like 32 new people, but that total cost might not be all that humongous when we think about it in the context, you know, of our whole state budget or some of the federal programming that could potentially be in front of us as we think about shifting food policy and climate policy and, and even just the pandemic and how we know that our regional food networks need to be really bolstered. And so Vermont is in a really amazing position in the Northeast, it feels to me anyway, that we could leverage that. Um, and if it's, you know, several million dollars worth of new money that comes in to support the already identified technical assistance, business advisors, and plug that into the system, that seems like something that's relatively doable for um, Vermont. It also feels like the network has a really cool opportunity or a part of the network, let's say, to identify very strategically which organizations that those resources live and how does it really build on the capacity you already have in that organization. Um, and I think it can be you know, a really great return on, on cost, great cost benefit there. Um, the other thing I just wanted to note is, is just when um, it came up around equity investors, what was it? It was 5% um, for women-owned businesses and 3% for BIPOC businesses and something along the lines of the investors are 90% white men. I was just blown away when that, those statistics were shared. And I know from like, the other side of my job, raising money, um, philanthropy, a lot of people who are making those decisions are female-led foundations or, you know, husband and wives. And, and you know, it's a female-led decision really about equity in our food system, the environment. And it just feels like there's a tremendous opportunity there um, to, to really unpack that some more. And, Maybe I'm just learning in that space a little bit, but that was, I was just really impressed um, with Janice's numbers there and also sort of blown away by some potential opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I will say um, an insight that uh, Ella Chapin shared with me a couple of days ago as we were preparing for this panel that I think is really uh, important to this conversation is we've been making, and we, and we, we laid this out in the brief, there's a difference in the language around uh, and intention and focus of business assistance versus technical assistance. And we really think it's important to start using that language in a similar way. Business assistance being more like business planning, enterprise analysis, really um, the, the strategic planning and direction of a business, supporting the management uh, teams functioning, getting advisory boards, those kinds of things, versus technical assistance, which is more of that like agronomic practices or permit specialists or engineering supports or accountants and bookkeepers, the folks that have, that might be doing more actual hands-on work with a farm or food business. And the insight that Ella shared that I think is right on, I hadn't seen this before, is the farm and for her farm viability network is really primarily of business assistance providers. And because they're doing business plans and our coaching program and land for good, doing succession planning, those kinds of things. In the, on the technical assistance side of things where we have identified a lot of additional FTEs that are needed, uh, probably more so than on the business assistance side, the, that community, while it's, 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 it's large and it's broad, it does not have the same network of uh, support itself meaning that those providers do not get together on a regular basis the way that the business 
advisors do. And there's nobody really holding that group to help them to be more connected, more coordinated, more strategic in their outreach and in their, their specific um, uh, support to farms and food businesses. So that's an area that I want to I want to dig into a little bit more because to Catherine's point, you know, how do we use the network over the next ten years to strengthen strengthen the bonds, strengthen the coordination, and we've got this whole group of technical assistance advisors that are that are that are doing great work, but they're not connected to each other. Uh, and how do we how do we strengthen that? Leslie, go ahead. So also when the 32 FTEs were first mentioned, I had written a note down of, can UVM in some way help with uh, making these connections? And I can't promise, but if there's anything that we can do to, to step in and help and make this happen, let me know. We will be, absolutely. And to Travis's point, you know, there are some of the recommendations where it does say Intervale should do blah, 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 or UVM extension should get so, such and such. Uh, or, uh, or NOFA should. So we do have the beginnings of that, but what I'd really like to do um, probably sometime, maybe even in January, is to pull the organizational leads together of folks that have business assistance advisors and technical assistance advisors on staff and get together and look at the whole list of the FTE requests and then figure out how do we how, just as Travis said, where do they best live that makes the most sense? Where do we gonna need federal funds? Where are we gonna need to tap state funds? Where do we get, look for foundation support? Where do we look to private to the private sector to support um, a position, for instance, like within a trade association, for instance. So we wanna have that conversation and, and, and we will pretty soon in the, the new year because it's a critical piece and it takes time to raise the money, right? And we can't be just raising money for like one year, we, we need multi-year commitments for these positions. So that's definitely on deck. Well, I, I was already thinking of a few ways that UVM might help. So we should probably talk afterwards. Yes. Um, I also had another question when Janice was speaking, um, but it, so it goes towards funding. Um, there's, there are groups such as something called Backstage Capital. They are in the Bay Area and they are specifically formed to help fund BIPOC. I think it's mostly for-profit enterprises, but I wonder if groups like them could be engaged to help other types of businesses, for example, in Vermont. And as you know, throughout history, uh, people of color have had a very hard time getting traditional funding from banks to support farms. And it's just a sad story that needs to be corrected. Yep. yep. Thanks, Leslie. Lawrence, you had your hand up? Yeah, um, I just thinking about the um, question of business advice versus technical advice. There's also this first step of getting people ready to seek advice. And um, how do you contract with outside advisors or technical assistants? What might you expect to pay? What are your obligations to make sure an engagement goes well. You know, these are things that are not intuitive necessarily. Maybe those are workshops or something like that, but helping people to hire well, because not all of these 32 FTEs might be embedded in government or organizations where they're going to be showing up with the client's best interest in mind. Um, we need to help folks advocate for themselves I think yeah no that's a great point one of the one of the uh, areas that is needed is more bookkeepers and uh, lawyers for instance who really understand farms and and uh, and succession specifically for farms there's a real dearth of lawyers out there so you're absolutely right they're not going to live at one of the home organizations that are part of this conversation they're going to be their private practice so how do we engage them uh, as well in this that's a great point yeah, Catherine. I want to just jump in again on um, kind of building the, the human resources and the, the capital, uh, human capital, it, you know, and in, in taking, trying to include um, funding or support for, you know, some of the smaller organizations uh, like GMFTS, for example, that could, could be considered more of like an entry level type of um, employer. And, you know, because as you create these 30 new plus FTEs, we need capable people 
to be able to fulfill the role. And, you know, I'm not sure that we have 32 people. I, I think it has shifted and we're obviously seeing a lot of people move into Vermont um, again in the wake of COVID. Um, but, you know, we've struggled be up in the corner of Newport to find reliable, knowledgeable, skilled, experienced people um, and wind up, you know, training within or kind of <laughs> raising a group of young people and um, <laughs> which sets you back a little. And so how could we be ready to fill those 32 positions with qualified people so that we're not waiting X amount of time to get up to speed to be able to provide the technical assistance? And is there a role for smaller organizations to play in that step in building that, that capacity? Um, and so then, and then another thing that I just wanted to, to bring out that bring up that kept coming up, and I, I guess I was a bit surprised, was the need for mental health supports. Um, and that was actually a recommendation in two of the, the three briefs and, you know, different contexts, but um, and, and also being discussed here. And that, so that seems critical to me, if that is being brought up as a, a recommendation, um, how do you engage the the human services, um, you know, the agency of human services perhaps is um, to get them involved in the conversation like um, the Department of Education and other agencies that could potentially support that work. Yeah, the, that's a really important point. And, and I would say that there's sort of two levels on the mental health side. One is when somebody really does need a, a, a personal counselor, you know, somebody, a professional to really work with them because they really do have mental health issues. But the other side is uh, being an entrepreneur, being a farmer is, can be really lonely. It's, you don't have people to talk to or you don't think you have people to talk to. And one of the things that we've done and Lawrence has been a big integral part of this during COVID as we've been, we've stood up uh, cohorts of companies Eight, eight clients at a, at, together and they meet every other week. And I can, I can absolutely say that the mental health of those entrepreneurs that are in those cohorts is far and above what anybody is uh, a farmer or food business that's not in a cohort because they have this regular group to talk to and share about what they're going through give each other advice. Uh, and we've seen some really remarkable resiliency from these entrepreneurs and food and, and farmers because of the fact that they've had this group that they can rely on in a confidential manner to talk about. So one of the, the suggestions in the business uh, assistance uh, brief was around more farmer to farmer or peer group related learning opportunities. That can also be a really important source of mental health support that we shouldn't overlook and, um, and and probably should be prioritizing more. And I think there's a role for the hubs, uh, for example, as a convener of their constituents. Um, same thing as there might be for other technical assistance providers that yeah. bring folks together. Yeah, yeah. Sam, you wanted to jump in, I saw? Yeah, I just wanted to, I wanted to sort of reiterate two points that came up um, and maybe re just reframe them a little bit. I think that Ella brought up the sort of what was the blueprint now is the Agricultural no. Advisors Network. Um, it's a regional network, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think, so I do think, and we're in the process of this already, it's really um, providing professional development for the people we have on the ground already, um, yeah. because I think we have some great practitioners, they just, um, they need a, a lot of professional development to be able to sort of elevate their level of service relating to the types of businesses that they're working with and the types of planning that they're doing. So I think that that is one area that uh, we should definitely place emphasis. Um, it's also a way to attract people coming into the state if they understand that there's a real path forward in those jobs that we're providing. Yep. So I think I think that that's an, just an area. And then the other one is that we really do need, there is just a total dearth of like tax, farm specific tax accountants and lawyers that are comfortable working on complex farm transfers. Yeah. Um, that it's just like, I was, <laughs> I fielded an, uh, an email today with a farmer that I've, re I've recommended two different lawyers to them. And both of those lawyers were like, we don't, I don't have any capacity. And that's basically, that's my list right now. You know, yeah. I, 
then yeah. I go to plan B and I'm not a lawyer and I <laughs> do not like to stand in in that capacity and be like, I know what I what they need in terms of legal assistance, but I can't provide it and I definitely can't yeah. draft those documents. So. Right. No, you're right on, right on, Sam. Thank you. So we're about to get yanked back into the bigger room. So I really want to thank you all. Good, rich conversation. And um, uh, I don't have any control, so we're going to get yanked. So, <laughs> but we'll have another, we'll have about 15 minutes. So um, looks like the 30 second countdown has, uh, has started and we'll, we'll pick up. Uh, so here we go. It's always amazing how that actually works. <laughs> All right. It is so fun to watch everybody just pop back in. All right, I think we're all back. Good, welcome. I hope you all had good conversations. Uh, Kyle joined us, so I, I, I don't know what happened, but uh, sounds like it was all good. I think I think everybody except for Representative Partridge was scared of the policy black hole that I was mentioned <laughs> at the beginning of uh, my conversation. Well, we're glad that you and, and uh, Representative Partridge joined us in, in our breakout group. So we have um, we have just a uh, little less than 15 minutes left here, and it's really about uh, I'd love to hear uh, snapshots from the other from all three groups, sort of what your takeaways were from. Uh, overall from this uh, breakout session in, in total, but specifically, you know, did you come up with anything as, as absolute priorities uh, in, your, in your Zoom breakout rooms? So uh, anything coming out of, of your, uh, your group, Ella? Let's see, um, we thought we had until 11.45, so we didn't, quite have as much time as I had, in, had expected, um, but I'll just highlight a couple of things that came up. Um, uh, PES came back up as, you know, an important overarching, um, uh, hits many, many needs. Um, so did agroforestry is sort of a opportunity um, that where you can stack many enterprises, it's a, you know, can contribute to sort of more dynamic economy, um, addresses a lot of other, again, sim similarly addresses a lot of sort of public and environmental needs. Um, and one thing that we talked about a little bit was uh, in the business and technical assistance networks, you know, I think a lot of us question whether we should be more strategic or more reactive in our work. And, you know, do we want to just, you know, be there for the entrepreneur when they have you know, their ideas and have a vision, or do we want to prioritize, particularly from my perspective, the public resources that go into um, some, of, some of our resources and prioritize or encourage certain, certain, you know, in terms of emerging markets and sectors. So that, that pull is always there <laughs> for a lot of us. Um, but I think places you see, you know, whether it's Europe or, you know, Southern Appalachia or, you know, I think of trends that we see that where, you know, there's a very big success of, 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 of a certain sector that have a feeling that there's a, a strategic investment being made there. And I think that's an important question for Vermont and one that we struggle with partly because of scale. Um, let's see some other themes that came out just generally I think there's a lot of opportunities for sort of new tools in what's already a solid structure around business and technical assistance. Um, so, you know, Eric's really promoting sort of advisory board and scenario planning tools, which, you know, could be new tools for the toolbox, right, in, in a structure that we already have really well built. We also talked about the need to sort of really understand the skills for the, like, what expertise do we need in place now and going forward? And do we have that, like, what do we actually have already? Um, you know, Betsy actually earlier in the day pointed out to me in our earlier group that like, so we know, you, you think you know you want 32 additional FTEs, how many FTEs are on the ground now? And I, we can't answer that, I don't think, we don't have that data. So just um, sort of thinking, how do we actually, again, sort of strategically really understand what we have now, what we want, how do you move there? Um, 
And along those lines, talked a little bit about the opportunities coming out of the Agricultural Viability Alliance around workforce development around like, let's get sort of a business, I'm sorry, a job description for what a business advisor agricultural business advisor does or you know multiple versions of that and then think about the training you know and be able to say here are all the training opportunities in our region that can help you get there and then do we want some kind of certification program something a little bit more formal um, at, to, to help really provide structure and professionalism to to the work that we do and a lot of, of us have been talking about that for years so I guess those um and then the last one I want to mention just um because I think it's really important around equity is sort of unpacking some the assumptions around land ownership, wealth, and how that plays into so much of our technical and business assistance, not to mention our conservation work and, and others beyond that. So we didn't quite get to um, some of the bigger questions you had posed, but I would say that in terms of sector specific, in terms of the structure of the network, I think the one thing that we just started to touch on is that regardless of what the next iteration of this, the, the farm to plate network looks like, some opportunity for sector specific conversations would be really can maybe the more impactful or, a, or an important piece to to incorporate whether it should be all designed around that maybe not sure and didn't necessarily hear a lot of push for that but i think that that's there's important role for it so when you say uh specific sector focus you're meaning particular products or what what do you mean by sector yeah, either product or enterprise types. So, you know, do we want to really have a group that focuses on hemp and, and the, that emerging market or pork and sheep or, you know, livestock or um, as opposed to production and processing all lumped together? Um, and I know that you're already thinking along those levels, but I think that's going to be an interesting part of the conversation. Yeah, great. Thank you. That was, that's excellent. Juicy, sounds like. Uh, Janice or anybody that was in the in the capital one want to share out some of the highlights from your discussion. So you've heard me talk. Anybody from our group wanna give highlights? Don't be shy. Having heard none. <laughs> Bueller, Bueller. All right. Um, I did take notes, so I will just um, go through briefly. Give me a second to pull them up. Just some highlights would be great. Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, we were we you as because of the time frame. I don't think we really got into any deep conversation related to um, over overly what the role of the network should be playing, but more broadly looking at. Um, a few things, first of all, related to the conversation we had around pulling in women and, and BIPOC investors to ensure that, um, you know, to ensure that money goes to those same types of uh, entrepreneurs, you know, a question was posed, well, what's the role of white men in all of this? And, you know, we had the conversation that um, it's, we want to you know, think about not only uh, women only events, but women focused events with white men, because there's they, still a good deal of power and money available. So how do we engage uh, that group as well, in addition to um, more women and, di and diversifying um, with BIPOC investors as well. So that was one piece. I think um, there, was, there was another uh, conversation related to um, the serious problem that a lot of farm businesses have with financial literacy and accessing resources. And you now th this goes in hand in hand with the TA discussion. Um, and, you know, as we, we have a very strong technical assistant advisory uh, system already in place in Vermont, but the, the challenge has always been getting people to um, learn about it, be aware of uh, the system itself, and then actually be able to access it. And so um, one of the things we talked a little bit about, is there a, uh, an elevator pitch that we all can have that says this is farm to plate and this is um, to articulate what the network does and how it can be available um, and how do we engage more entrepreneurs in the network beyond the service providers. Um, and then I think lastly, um, you know, if we, we talked about who should be at the table and, you know, predominantly the conversation and we were, mind you, a group of all women um, uh, and those who identify as women um, that we want to get, you know, young emergent women, invite them, 
mentor them, encourage them to be at the table. Um, the power isn't being handed off enough to all these uh, more diverse um, groups related to uh, the, the what we do in our own organizations and in the network. So how can we consciously go out and, and invite young women to the table and give them opportunity to learn uh, and sit on boards, et cetera? Great. Nice. So uh, anybody want to share what uh, our, our group uh, focused on? Some highlights? please. <laughs> I'm happy to share based on some of the thoughts that I heard, which is actually really interesting because they very much align with some of the agency's legislative priorities for, for FY22. So I think it's always reassuring when it seems like we're, we're mostly on the same page. So some of the themes that came up in our kind of like open-ended conversation was around um, land use planning, really seeking some clarification around this accessory on farm business, three um, applicability and application across the state for businesses, um, uh, opportunities for more business collaboration. So that could be on the mentoring side of things that could be a cohort model, um, as well as looking at different support networks. So that could be additional business advisors. We talked about a distinction between business assistance and technical assistance, really trying to make that divide um, clear, clarified and known. Um, acknowledging that there were so many FTEs kind of identified collectively in the briefs that there's this need for additional human resources with the proper training, kind of similar to what Ella's group talked about of identifying what the skills and the needs are and ensuring that um, we have the staff capacity to address some of those needs. Um, recognizing there's some unmet needs out there. So as businesses transition, looking at um, tax preparers and attorneys and other kind of business and technical assistance skills that we don't currently have kind of a, a established network. The skills may exist out there, we don't even actually know in some cases because they're not part of our established kind of cohort. Um, we talked about leveraging our location in the Northeast, um, talked about opportunities for increasing investments for some of the uh, BIPOC and women and minority owned businesses. Um, we talked about making sure we had support for all scales of organizations. So kind of building that pipeline of job creation and career development opportunities. And then I think lastly, which we which already touched on, but um, really wanting to build that network and a clear gathering place for technical assistance providers. So in concert with the viability networks, business advisors really start to identify what's out there for talent and capacity and skill set within a broader technical assistance. Thanks, Abby. Ella, I shared your insight with my group about the, uh, the fact that the technical assistance advisory community does not have the same kind of uh, support system the way that the business advisors do through the the, the um, farm viability network of business advisors and that, that that's a real gap that we might want to uh, spend some time building up some kind of a, of a network of just the technical assistance advisors. So that uh, was a great interest to a lot of people. So thank you for sharing that insight with me the other day. I've been already told a lot of people. <laughs> well, and if we do that, we should make sure they're well connected which I think generally happens anyway, because many of the organizations that do this work, like, you know, NOFA and UVM Extension, you know, have, have both, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So other thoughts and takeaways, we've got about five minutes left here, just, you know, like just overall, what thoughts on, on this intersection of these three areas um, that still we wanna, we wanna bring out, bring forward. Any ahas that you're taking away from this session? Or additional clarifying questions? Well, 
this, this is Eric. Um, I, across this session before and after the breakout, I've really posted my three um, items that I have to share on these topics. And two of them really come out of the work of the financing cross-cutting team. Um, and so recruitment opportunity for the chair of the financing cross-cutting team with the caveat, is there going to be a financing cross-cutting team? What is the role of financing in Farm to Play 2.0? Um, so you might wonder, well, what did the financing cross-cutting team do anyway over the last 10 years or the last three years? And so the links that I provided show you, I think robust sort of outcomes on two key themes. One being the, the role that advisory boards can play in helping entrepreneurs not commit suicide and also succeed in business. Um, online videos and, and digestible modules that are in beta now and your feedback would be wonderful. Um, and um, two, farm transfers, the risk of the loss of all of Vermont's farmland and us just living in a New Jersey suburb in 20 years. And um, so the financing for farm transfers, that was something that we dug deep on with a um, targeted uh, gathering of key stakeholders um, in early 2019. And so the takeaways from that um, are also, I put a link to um, in the chat. And, um, you know, uh, just the highlighted theme there is that if you've got a new uh, farmer and their thrust thought is, I must own land or I'm not going to continue. Um, there's a lot of inherent um, traps and potential sort of death threats for their business and their farm ownership in that assumption. And so starting to unpack that, and Janice mentioned some of the resources like your capital partners and the fund that Vermont Land Trust is creating to help really get under the hood on um, what are you really thinking when you say you need to own a farm today? And how does that relate to the farm business you say you want to develop? So those are two. I mentioned before the scenario planning. So those are really my big three right. advisory boards, yep. transfer financing with an emphasis on uh, alternative models Great. for ownership. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Jeannie, I saw you trying to jump in. Yeah, thanks, Ellen. Um, I guess I just have a question about all the FTEs that were identified as needed again, and, and Ella touched on this. Year, but um, with seeing continued cuts to staff at UVM and asking them to wear multiple hats and all of this, just what are what are the prospects for hiring that needed technical and business assistance? Um, and also, I imagine that this is happening, but I'm just curious to what extent the the teams writing this brief collaborated with the teams writing all the um, industry specific or product specific briefs. Like I know, like the Apple's brief, for instance, said we need technical assistance on this and this topic. So just what kind of cross communication was there? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so there was no, there was, if, if there was any cross collaboration between brief teams, it was by accident uh, or in a, every once in a while, someone wanted to do that intentionally. So that is sort of the next work is to, assemble a group of people that wanna look at all of the requests for additional capacity and take a look and see, okay, what are, are some of these positions actually combinable? You know, especially in the near term, could, could somebody do apples and bees, for instance, as just as a, for instance. Um, and then we also need to look at where should they, where should these positions live? How many of them should be at UVM Extension versus Intervale versus GM uh, Green Mountain Farm to School versus some other place? So all that work still has to be done. Um, and then also remember, this is a 10 year plan. So it's not like we're gonna flip a switch and we're gonna have 32 and a half FTEs on the ground in year one. We, we need to build a very strategic uh, forward looking plan for how we're gonna bring on people because we've gotta find the funding for them. And as I mentioned in my group, um, you know, these are the kind of things where you can't just have one year of committed funds. You need at least three years of committed funds because these are, you're gonna hire somebody of quality. They, it's gonna, it's six months learning on the job just to, get really fully productive and, and up to speed and have a client base. So um, it's gonna take some time, it's gonna take some more thinking and, um, and that's the work that lies ahead in 2021 is to really unpack that. So thank you for that question. Um, 
it's it's an important one. So um, I think uh, we are actually at time. I need to let, release Lydia so she can go set up the the final our final room together. So we'll leave this one and then go to the website um, and you can click on the uh, link for the final closing section session. Please do join us. Be great to close out all together. And we'll be wrapping up at uh, 1220 at the latest. So thank you all so much for coming to this breakout session. Really, really rich discussion and lots to do, but that's the whole point, right? So, all right, take care everybody. And thanks so much. Thank you.